All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Jess LeClaire. I'm Senior Program Director with Sustainable CT. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. We've got an exciting topic to discuss and some wonderful speakers who are going to share out on the work that they're doing in this field. So today we're talking about building resilience in your communities. Specifically, we're talking about funding and tools available to help you do this work. This morning, we're joined by several guest speakers who are going to share about the various resources that are available to you as you navigate building resilience in your city or town. So first up, we're going to hear from two representatives from Throw Environmental, Kyle Gray, the Chief of Staff, and Justin Giffey, a policy analyst with Throw. Kyle and Justin are going to discuss the National Fish and Wildlife's Long Island Sound Futures Fund. And I'm gonna turn it over to you right away to get going. And if you have questions, we're gonna save them for the very end. So feel free to keep them in mind, jot them down or pop them in the chat. So with no further ado, Kyle and Justin, it's all you. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. I will let Justin pull up the slides here, but just wanted to thank folks for taking the time out of their Friday to join this presentation. Um, we'll get into the basics of the fund and give you a sense of, you know, what a competitive proposal looks like and some of the main elements of this funding program. But I do want to start, we can go right to the next slide with some background on, on Throw Environmental and who our team is and what our actual purpose here is. So Throw Environmental is a consulting firm based out of Bristol, Rhode Island. So very close to you all in Connecticut. And we do work nationally, but quite a bit of it is focused in the Mid-Atlantic and in New England, specifically in the Long Island Sound watershed. And essentially, our, our mission is to focus on building community resilience, leadership, and action, all with an investment and a funding lens. When it comes to this program, we do that by serving as field liaisons. So what that means is we are really the outreach arm of the Long Island Sound Futures Fund. We are helping to promote the program. We're helping folks get a better sense of what is competitive in this program and what is eligible. And that can be in a really direct you know, uh, conversation. We can work one-on-one -on -one with folks who are thinking about applying for a proposal to help them build out that idea and frame it in a way that will help them be successful. Or it can be broader uh, in webinars or conferences like this, where we can uh, provide basic information about the fund and you know, bring that to many people at once. So there's really different ways to approach it, um, but at the end of the day, it's all meant to help build competitive proposals for the Futures Fund. So if we can go to the next slide, um, I want to start with some funding opportunities in the region, you know, that are broadly um, relevant to folks in Connecticut, and then we'll dive in specifically to the Long Island Sound Futures Fund. So just very quickly here, some other NIFWF opportunities include the Northeast Forest and Rivers Fund. That's between seventy-five dollars and $300,000, and that's an annual program. The RFP just opened, and I believe it's now due in July, um, and it's really focused on habitat, specifically forested river habitat for uh, native bird and fish species. So if the, the benefits of a project that you have are really focused on habitat and species benefits, that's a, a good opportunity for you and I would recommend looking into it. Um, a couple of national opportunities are listed here. So there's the America the Beautiful Challenge, which is around $120 million. That one is really meant uh, to find the nexus point between various different funder priorities. So you'll see that Departments of Defense, Interior, and Agriculture are funders in this program. So if you happen to have a project, then maybe this is around one of the installations in Connecticut. If you have a project with military benefits, maybe conservation benefits, and agriculture benefits, in that unique situation, this could be really great funding for you because they'd like to see folks check off all of those boxes. So it's a, a niche opportunity, but it could be worthwhile if you happen to fit the bill. Um, there's also an Acres for America program, which is meant for um, urgently needed conservation projects, specifically land acquisition. So if that's something, you know, that cannot wait and there's an urgent opportunity, there is some funding there nationally. And then there's uh, more of a capacity building program in the Five Star and Urban Waters program that's meant to develop local partnerships to help sustain natural resources into the future. The final program that I'll just quickly overview before we do the deep dive into the Futures Fund is uh, the National Coastal Resilience Fund. So our team at Throw also serves as field liaisons for this program. So we can certainly speak to this a bit more. We're really focused in this program on nature-based solutions that help in, in, uh, enhance coastal resilience, um, really focused on sea level rise, flooding, and erosion. There also have to be fish and wildlife benefits there, but we're really focused on, again, nature-based aspects that will help us enhance coastal resilience. 
So we can go to the next slide and that will kick us off with the futures fund. That's the main topic here today, but the other ones will give you a little bit of context. Um, so next slide, we can go to some of the funding here. So the Long Island Sound Futures Fund um, is an annual program. It's been around since the early 2000s. Typically it was around three to $5 million, but with all of the federal investment that came up in the past few years with the BIL and the IRA, um, the program has now risen to about $12 million. So they expect 12 million to be awarded in 2024. And most of the funding is coming from EPA with some coming from the Long Island Sound Study and Fish and Wildlife Service as well. Um, I bring up EPA in particular though, because so much of, of that funding is focused on water quality and quite a bit of this program is as well. And I think you'll see that reflected. Um, next slide, we can start to talk about some of the themes here. So I just wanna spend a minute on this to make sure folks understand how they're supposed to, to talk about these themes and these different planning aspects in their proposal. So very briefly, the Long Island Sound Study has this large planning document. It's essentially the comprehensive plan for the sound and it's called the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan or the CCMP. So the most recent five-year update is actually just coming to a close in uh, this year. And there will be an update uh, starting in 2025. So things may shift moving forward. But as of right now, the CCMP is you know, the governing document. And this, this iteration is the governing document that relates back to this program. And if the CCMP is the major you know, master plan, you can think of the futures fund then as the funding arm of that plan, really meant to pay for projects and help implement. So there are various different umbrellas in this theme, you know, different themes or uh, large umbrella ideas that projects should fall under. The biggest are, they're called the, the cross-cutting principles. And there are three here, they're resilient, sustainability, and environmental justice. And really, I think it's, it's simplest to understand this by just knowing you should really aim to work resilient sustainability and environmental justice in wherever possible, right? You can never really have too much of those cross-cutting principles in a proposal. So whenever you have the opportunity to add aspects of those different principles into your proposal, I would definitely recommend that. Now, the, the next umbrella, maybe one step below, are these CCMP themes. So this is where you should only pick one theme. And depending on where you are in Connecticut, you're eligible for three different themes. So we can help you iron out which would be most appropriate for you. The one we'll spend the most time talking about because it is eligible statewide is the clean waters and healthy watersheds theme. So this is all focused on water quality in terms of nutrient reductions and nitrogen pollution. So this can be really focused on point or non-point source pollution. You'll see some examples here that are focused on green infrastructure, which would be very non-point source, but there's also wastewater opportunities, whether that's on-site treatment or retrofits, and that would be more point source. Um, a lot of conversation or a lot of proposals come in around stream buffers or stream channel reconnection, again, meant to reduce erosion, slow water flow, all with the idea of improving water quality and reducing nutrients. Um, next slide, we've got a few more examples of uh, these nitrogen reduction projects. Right sizing culverts comes up a lot. Um, we can talk more about that if there are questions. There's also technical assistance in the ag world. So that can be to engage landowners, to help address farm scale runoff. And I think on the next slide, we've got a couple more ag examples as well. Um, I think here, yeah, we've got regenerative ag, soil health best practices, and precision nutrient management. So there's a range of how we're getting to those nitrogen reductions. Really, they're willing to be flexible. These are just some examples of how you might do that. Um, next slide, Justin, we can go on to the resilience theme. And I'm gonna skip over number two for a second and we can talk about that last. So the sustainable and resilient communities theme is the third one, and this is another option for you. But again, you only want to pick one of these themes. This one in particular is so again, it's statewide and it's meant to educate and engage communities all with the goal of enhancing coastal resilience. So that can look a number of different ways. It can be public stewardship and educating folks about the sound, the resources that the sound uh, provides. It can be educating folks about resilience and coastal resilience. Um, there's opportunities for public access, you know, education through environmental justice initiatives or social marketing. And there's also opportunities, I believe on the next one, um, it'll say nature-based resilience opportunities. So these can be things like natural or green infrastructure, not so much water quality focused though, more focused on water quantity, 
the amount of water that you're taking in, sea level rise, flooding, intense storms, um, all again meant to enhance the resilience of the communities across the state. So that is another theme or another bucket of, of um, proposals that this program will fund. Now, very quickly, the one I skipped over is number two, and that's the thriving habitats theme. So that theme is only eligible for folks on the coast, and we will uh, show in just a second what that map looks like. But I wanna start by just mentioning our team at Throw Environmental, we serve as field liaisons outside of the coastal zone. We're working in inland Connecticut, as well as the upper basin. And maybe it is a good time to switch slides, Justin, so we can uh, show what that map looks like. So the upper basin will be anywhere in the watershed ahead of Connecticut. So that would be Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire. If you happen to work across states, our team works there and anywhere that falls within that red boundary, we would be able to help with the proposal. On the next slide, you'll see for Connecticut specifically that there's this delineation between inland Connecticut and the coastal zone for this program. So the, the first theme that I mentioned, the clean habitats that's focused on water quality, as well as the third theme that's focused on resilience can happen statewide and can certainly happen in this lighter green um, inland area. The second theme focused on thriving habitats, that's more focused on coastal habitat restoration. Um, that is only eligible in the coastal zone. So if there's confusion there, if there are questions on what is eligible where, I'm happy to answer questions. I would say though, if you are in the coastal area and are looking to put together a thriving habitats proposal, there is other technical assistance that's available for you. Our team is just more focused on inland Connecticut and the upper basin because projects just haven't haven't been on the ground there as much over the past couple of decades. So that is a very quick overview of most of the program. Justin's gonna go through a few more logistics and then uh, we will wrap up. Okay, thank you, Kyle. So uh, I'll just be covering kind of the range of the funds that are available for uh, the grant here, right? So there are different types of stages um, for these grants and they will all receive different amounts of funding. So the first being design and planning, right? So this is around 50,000 to 500,000. Um, and this is a hard stop. So 500,000 is the maximum here. Same for, you know, the 1.5 million and then the 100,000 in that education. So implementation, what we mean by that is shovel ready projects, ready to uh, get going on the ground. Uh, funding for that will be around 50,000 to 1.5 million. Um, public participation and education, uh, while only available in Connecticut and New York, are available for uh, 50,000 to 100,000 in grant eligibility. And here you see some of the stages, right, for these grants. So we're starting off here at the very beginning with the preliminary community engagement, planning, prioritization. And then you have these steps here, project site feasibility, uh, project site assessment, preliminary design, and then you're moving along, you're going into final design, securing permits, and then you have this implementation here. So this table is helpful uh, for mapping out uh, what stage of the project you should be aiming to um, gear your application towards and kind of the language that you use to describe the actions that are ongoing with your proposal. So these are just some grant guidelines here, right? A little bit about the performance period. So um, starting within six months and completing within 24 months after the grant award, I think is the uh, ideal timeline for the planning and design grants, okay? For the large scale implementation, projects should start within six months of receiving that award and be completed within 36 months and then just another uh, deadline here, right? The proposal due date is May 13th. Again, that's a hard stop. Um, so after May 13th, no longer accepting applications. And then throughout that summer afterwards and fall, they'll be reviewing these different applications. And then, you know, come November, they will start announcing those grant awards. Now, match is a, is a big component of this fund. Um, it does pose a challenge for some applicants and at Throw Environmental, um, we can help you uh, work around um, this sort of challenge and give you kind of ideas of how you can come up with this match component, right? So it's 50% of the requested amount to start 
And there's different types of matches that you can list within your proposal, right? There's non-federal, so cash funds and or in-kind services. What we mean by that is, you know, contributions of staff time, uh, materials, services donated either uh, by your org organization or another. Um, they must be deployed during the start and end date of the project. So uh, not beforehand, not afterwards. It's within that project timeline. And as I said before, at Throw Environmental, we can help you think through how you propose this match component. Can be a little tricky for some folks. 50% can be a little bit high, but we're happy to help you work around that. There's plenty of ways you can do that. So real quick here, it's just some ineligible activities or items for this funding. Right, using money for research, operations, or new educational curriculum, um, marketing and funding for different types of promo gear, t shirts, stuff like that. As well as lastly, here, um, you know, easement acquisitions of land, political adv advocacy, litigation, and lobbying. These are all activities that do not fit within. Uh, this funding. So just make sure that you're not including these parts within the specific uh, project that you're trying to get funded here. And as for requesting feedback, right, and kind of getting some assistance with your application. So uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, or NIFWIF as we call them, uh, you can book a proposal lab with them. You can also book a proposal lab with us at Throw Environmental. So the two differences here, um, if you have more specific applications for maybe how ideas in your project fit within uh, the NIFWIF kind of guidelines and the project priorities, it's more specific questions related to your, your project, um, feel free to book a session with them. You can talk with them about those questions in a proposal lab. Alternatively, you can meet with us and ask those same questions and we can do our best to answer them. Um, again, questions that are more tailored specific to your project. Um, however, if you're looking to just kind of work through big picture ideas, that's more of what we do. Um, we can help answer those big questions that you might have and work through some challenges that you, know, you might anticipate. So those are the two differences between those proposal labs. Now, when you're thinking of, you know, questions before you get into this proposal or you're thinking about a possible project, you want to be thinking of these kind of uh, listed bullet points here, right? So number one, what is the problem that you're looking to address with this project? And obviously, what is the relevance to the restoration and the health and living resources of the Long Island Sound, right? So it's not, um, it's, it's going to be important to explain this relevance and demonstrate it throughout your application, starting with the title. And we'll get into that, what the specifics look like in writing um, in the following slides. But you wanna make it clear that it's related to the Futures Fund and their own program priorities, right? Next is what is the solution that is being pursued with your project? And get into the specifics. So what are the major activities going to be? in those in those solutions right what are the action items leading up to it third right just the basics where is the project located okay where is the project site um what are the adjacent surrounding watersheds or water bodies what does that look like again you know what city state is that and another one that we don't have listed here that you should keep in mind and will be very important to include is specific community assets so you know, making sure that you mention, you know, if there's a bridge there, if there's neighborhoods, there's streets that are being affected, name those streets, um, do the best that you can to describe those uh, precisely. It gives NIFWIF a good idea of what's going on and uh, they can get a little bit better sense of this project and kind of how people are being affected in the community, right? Um, what is the approximate size of the grant to be requested? This will be important, right? As you submit your application, have to make that match component 50%. So trying to gauge what those numbers are looking like. 
and who will be the applicant organization, right? So are you going to be the one submitting your application? Would it be a partner in the project that's going to submit it? These are some things that you'd want to work out before getting into it. And then lastly, right? So looking for receiving feedback. Again, we at Through Environmental are available throughout this whole process. Um, we cannot specifically write these applications for you, but we can provide technical assistance, help you work through big picture ideas, and so forth. Be available throughout the uh, beginning of the process. Afterwards, when you receive your grant, we are here for you as a resource. So again, just um, to go over this timeline again, right? The RFP is open. Uh, proposals are due on May 13th. And that review period is going to be that following summer and fall of this year. And awards should be announced in November of this year. So May 13th, remember that. And questions, how can we help you? Um, this is our support staff right here, Chris Cortina. He's our program manager, kind of our right-hand man to NIFWIF, um, works directly with them. So we will have this slide up at the end for you so you can get this contact info down and we'll share these slides with you as well. Um, but Victoria Moreno, she is the program manager on the NIFWIF side, specifically for Futures Fund. Um, at the end of our presentation here, Kyle and I will throw our emails in the chat too. You can feel free to reach out to us. And then before we wrap up here, I'm just going to run through some of the funding basics, kind of the different stages of writing in your application process. So the before, during, and after. Let's start with the before, right? So again, you're thinking of those questions that um, I mentioned a few minutes earlier, right? You're picking the right project. You're thinking about the program you're applying to. Is it going to be Futures Fund, right? Are you looking through some of these other funding opportunities that Kyle might have listed earlier? Are these more geared towards what you're working with in your community? Um, does your action items, do your solutions match up with the Futures Fund's own priorities? If not, might be worth considering uh, different funding options, right? So before um, you get to writing, you're developing your idea, you're working with your community, you're understanding their perspective, you're engaging them, um, you're establishing a clear plan, right? So you're trying to think of a timeline, how can things be accomplished? What are those different project stages that you'd be at, right? That ladder kind of, that was those boxes going down, right? Um, are you in the planning part where it's preliminary design? Is it going to be immediately ready for implementation off the bat? You know, you want to identify where you think you fall under those stages because you can only apply to one, right? So you're thinking about responsibilities here. What's your organization's role? What are some of your partner's roles going to be? Do you have partners, right? Um, so once you've, you know, identified this is the right program for you, uh, you're confirming eligibility. You want to, again, think about this match component, how you can meet that 50%. You're thinking about project types, priorities of the program, the CCMP theme that you can identify within your own project and speak about eloquently in your application. And then lastly here, right? If you want to workshop some ideas, you don't know if this is the right program for you, reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Okay. So now you're in the during, your writing um, is getting started. You want to you set the tone early here and really off the bat, give them um, a great idea of what your project is all about. So the way you can do that is demonstrating how this funding will help your project and what we mean by selling your project, again, is relating your language, the action items within your project, the steps leading up to the solution. How is this related to the program itself? And you can specifically use language that they have in there. They probably like seeing that. Um, so you're paying attention to keywords. 
and what we mean by adapting to the grant, right? Changes a little bit, it's going to change next year. Um, so if you're applying next year, right, you want to identify um, the year that you are um, submitting your application, making sure it's up to date with what Futures Fund is saying. Uh, during this uh, writing stage of the project, you know, you want to continue to build relationships within your community and your partners. It's never too early to look into permitting. It doesn't have to be completely done or anything near that. But at least having an idea of what that would look like would be helpful. Okay, and then you're moving into the final stage here, right? So you think you're done. You've done a lot of hard work. You want to make sure that you reread, you revise what you've written, right? You have a strong title, an abstract. So right away, readers can understand what your project is doing, where it is, what's at risk, what it's looking to accomplish and the timeline for which it's operating, right? As well as who's the partners, okay? So again, you're comparing back to program priorities. Right away, you're tackling the CCMP theme that you are working with within your project, right? So these are the things that you want to make sure that you make very, very clear in your application before you submit. So now let's say you submit and you don't get funded. You know, no worries. Um, part of our job as field liaisons is helping applicants understand what might have um, gone wrong here. What are some room uh, for improvement? How can they recycle some of this language uh, for an upcoming funding cycle? So you can get feedback from us on that. We'll help you build on these weaknesses here, help you get a stronger application ready for the next cycle. Okay. So that is all we have for you. I'm going to go back to this slide with the emails. Excellent. Thank you so much, Justin and Kyle. That was wonderful. And we will share out this slide deck with folks. So you'll have these email addresses to access later on if you want to reach out. So we are holding questions for the end because we do want to hear from Sarah Schechter who is the assistant extension, uh, assistant extension Educator for Sustainable and Resilient Communities with Connecticut Sea Grant. And Sarah's gonna share out about a new tool that's available to you all. It's the Long Island Sound Resilience Resource Hub. It's a comprehensive online resource center offering tools, guidance, and inspiration to cities and towns seeking to build their resilience. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. And Justin, if you want to stop the share so Sarah can share her uh, Resilience Hub. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, and also, this works out really well because uh, some of the things that were discussed were the Sustainable and Resilient Communities theme for the CCMP. Um, that's actually where my work falls under. Um, and I'm also on the team who is helping to rewrite the CCMP. So I have been focusing a lot on those different those different uh, goals and themes and actions. Um, and uh, we'll be able to see a little bit of all of that on, on the website as well. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, sorry, my... All right, and you're able to see the, the website? Yeah, looks great. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run through different aspects of it um, and just go into each of the sections. Um, and then as Jess said, we're gonna hold questions till the end, but feel free to pop things in the chat as you think of them. Um, and as I click on things, there might be a slight delay as we wait to go from section to section on the site, um, but we will try and keep it moving. Um, so first we have the, the homepage. And so when you get onto here, it's listresilience.org, which I will pop in the, the chat later so that um, you're able to access it on your own. Um, and then we have these drop down menus right here. And so this goes into the planning phases where it's learn, plan, implement, uh, and sustain, which we heard, just heard a little bit about. Um, then you can click on your location that you're in. And so we focus on Connecticut and New York, um, right around the Long Island Sound. And so you can uh, pick your um, your options for tools, uh, different things that you want to have based off of where you're, where you want to focus. Um, and then you can pick it based off of topics. So there's a really wide array of things. Um, and we've tagged each aspect based off of each of these, um, these topics that are available. And so, 
um, this, this decision tree is available. And you don't have to select one from each of them. You could just select, for example, you want to know about things in Fairfield County, um, and you don't have to click the other ones. But the more specific you are, um, the, the more uh, closely aligned the resources that you're given are going to be. Um, so for example, if we want to look at, um, at Learn, we can click on that. Um, and then we could do uh, Fairfield County, and then we could do uh, Extreme Weather and Storms. And so we could click in there, um, give it a second to load. And so then that'll bring you to an array of things that have been tagged directly within the Learn, Fairfield County, and Extreme Weather and Storms categories. And so one that you might find from there is the, um, I quite figured out one that I wanted to show, but really doesn't matter. Um, so for example, you might have the EPA storm surge inundation map. Um, this is a story map and it also shows the level of effort. So this means that it's gonna be easier to go through. So we have it for, on a one to three scale. Um, and again, this one's tagged with that extreme weather and storms and it's also in flooding. So you can click on view details. It'll give you a little bit of information about that. And then you can go to the resource and it'll bring you directly to that story map. Um, and so it'll have all of that information there. Um, another one that we could do is if we're looking in the, the plan category, um, we could do plan, we could select, um, could select Suffolk County, um, and then we could do, uh, water quality and then we'll click on that. And then again, it's going to bring you to different options here. We have a case study available. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those after, um, but another one that's available is um, we had the uh, the Suffolk County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, there's uh, NOAA Digital Coast, and so some of these are going to be based directly around that location, and some of them are going to be a lot further, um, a lot broader. Um, and and that's why the the option to to focus in on the phase is helpful. Um, you can also go back in. You could select uh, implement. You can select, uh, for example, Westchester, um, and then. Uh, select uh, nature-based solutions. We can apply that directly there. And so again, you can do it directly from that main homepage or you can do it right in the filter section. And then it'll bring you to another collection of options. Um, and so this is, this is really helpful to be able to see everything all up front. Um, and then you can do the same with sustain again. You could just switch that to sustain. You can apply the filters and then it's just going to bring you to options that are based right around that sustain category. Um, so then as we move down, again, you have learn, plan, implement, and sustain right here. It gives you a little bit more information about what each of them are when you hover over them. So that's really helpful to get a little quick understanding of that. Um, and then we have the, the map. And so this is a bit more interactive. You can zoom in and out on it. Um, but for example, if you're trying to look for like a Middlesex County for um, resources that are in there, you can click directly where you're at and you'll be brought into those resources and it will again filter your location based directly off of the county um, and you'll have all of the options that are that are available to you there. Um, looking back at the the main page again we have our featured resources and so this includes the funding database, the case studies, the upcoming trainings and events, the training archives, uh, the resilience planning guide, grant writing assistance, and I'm going to go through all of these a little bit more in depth um, as we continue on. Um, but all of these are easy to access right on the first page, which is um, a really nice thing to have. Um, then we have our resilience topics. And so this is every single one of those, those tags that were available. This is then broken down again. And so if you, if you don't want to have to worry about the, the drop down menus, you can just go through here. They're listed alphabetically. And so you can just click on one. It'll bring you directly to the, the options that are available. So with flooding, again, it's going to bring you to everything that is tagged with flooding. Um, and then it will show up here again with that topic. Um, then uh, we have our... Um, I'm going to go in through all these now. So we have our funding database. Um, and so this actually, so we just heard about the futures fund. So you can see that it, there are 23 days left to apply. Um, it gives you information about, uh, how much, uh, fun, how many funds, how much, uh, funds you can request from it. Um, and there's also an overview of it available. Um, and then there's also all of those tags, um, and that's available for, for all of the funding sources that we have here. 
Um, and so this is a great way to know how things are, like when things are due. Um, and then you can also select based off of when things are open. You can choose the planning phase, uh, pick your location, topic, and also the applicant type. And so it, you can really uh, curate this, this search to make sure it's something that you are eligible for, something that's gonna match with your project, and also that it's available and open. Um, and it will talk about the, the match requirements um, and kind of all of that information that you're really looking to have. Um, something else that's really cool is that we have grant writing assistance available. And so that is through the Long Island Sound Study. And so with that, um, we offer funds to grant writers. And so this is something that uh, towns, municipalities, uh, nonprofits, NGOs, um, you can apply into the grant writing assistance program. And so you would uh, come in with a grant writer of your choice. Um, and as long as it falls within that coastal boundary, which is listed here, um, and also is a project that um, support that uh, supports the the CCMP supports the Long Island Sound Studies mentality. Um, then we can fund that grant writer to write that grant up to nine thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to be able to to help to bypass um, some of those those issues that might come into to trying to have someone write your grant. Um, and we call that our breaking down barriers program. And so all of the um, the options that can include that. Um, are listed. So anything that says grant writing assistance available, and even if it doesn't, you can always check in with us. Um, we try to make sure it's tagged wherever it's available. Um, but if you have another grant in mind, you can always check in um, and we can we can have a conversation about that as well. Um, so that's our funding database. Then we have our case studies. And so these are some great options to see what's go what's been going on within that coastal boundary and some of the uh, the things that you can check out. Um, so for example, we had the Strong Pond uh, Dam removal at Mer Mer Merwin Meadows. And so you can click on that and then it's gonna tell you more about that project. So here we have some pictures. You can know the partners that were involved. It's gonna give you an overview of the project itself. And then it's also gonna talk about um, what type of project it was and some more of the information. Um, you can learn about the permits, the cost, um, and it also has some contact information. So if this is a project that you're interested in or something you're looking to do similar to, then you have people that you can reach out to so that you can learn uh, the different aspects and the different um, steps that they had to go through for it. Um, and so we have those uh, spaced throughout the area. Also, if there are case studies that, um, that you know about, um, please feel free to send in some information or you can reach out. We can have a conversation. We can talk more about um, getting those placed on the map so that more people can continue to do great projects and have examples uh, available to them. Um, so then after that, we have the upcoming trainings and events. So right now we don't have anything available um, that's, that's on our calendar. We will be hosting more things throughout the year. And we do have a newsletter that you can subscribe to, and I'll show you that link later. Um, but that's where we're going to put in more information about when we're having our annual workshop, when we're having different funding workshops, when we're really trying to, to get people together and, and talk about what we do. Um, and so that will be posted there, but we don't have anything up there at the moment. Um, and then we have our trainings archive. And so this includes all of the trainings that we have done so far. Um, which includes our annual workshops. We've done the grant writing assistance webinar. Um, and so when you click on those, um, you can take a look and it, it'll bring you into um, some information about the webinar itself or the workshop. And then it will also have all of the videos. And so you should be able to click on those, watch them and get all of the information that you would have gotten had you been able to attend. Um, and this is also, if you were able to attend and you just wanted to check back, it's always gonna be posted up there um, and again, these are tagged as well so that um, you can find them uh, using that the drop down menus as well. Um, and then we have um, then we have our resilience planning guide. And I'm going to give kind of a broad overview of this. Again, we're going to share the, the website after so you can take a deeper look. But we have these persists criteria, and this was adopted from something from the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation, or better known as CIRCA. Um, and so each of these criteria are ways to kind of frame your, um, uh, put together, frame your, your narrative and start to put together how you want to ask questions and really think through uh, what what you're trying to do and how you're putting together grants, how you're putting together ideas, in that you want to make sure that things are permittable, equitable, realistic, safe, 
innovative, scientific, uh, scientific transferable and sustainable. And there's a little bit more information on each of these right here. And then also we have each of them outlined below. And so for example, if you're looking for equitable related resources, you can cl click on that. And then, sorry for the delay. Um, and then it'll bring you into a whole list of options again, uh, letting you know the level of effort. Um, and so you can see, for example, there's the EPA EJ screen. And so if you go to that resource, it's gonna show you a little bit more about that tool um, and, and to walk you through it a little bit. Um, and so all of the sources are, are tagged here. Um, and again, there's a whole array of them to take a little bit more of a look at. So again, this is a lot of information. It's a lot to take in. And I know that it's great to have, um, have a look here. You'll be able to rewatch the recording of this, um, but we can also have more, more, uh, more conversations about it. And so you can connect with us. Um, and so if you click here, this will bring you to a to an um to our connect with us page, and so we have this map. So for example, if you're over in Eastern Connecticut, um, you click on that. That's my focus. So this has my my phone number, my email, and then you can also subscribe to the Eastern Connecticut newsletter. It'll bring you to this site. You'll just put in some information about yourself. The most important thing is your email, just because that's how we send things out. Um, and then, uh, but you can also contact me using that as well. Um, for Western Connecticut, that's going to be Deb Abibu, and you can subscribe to her newsletter. Her and I tend to work together on the newsletters, and so when we send them out, it's going to be a, a Connecticut-wide uh, one. But if you're looking to have things that are directly in Western or Eastern Connecticut, just make sure to subscribe to those accordingly. Um, we do have three counterparts that are in Suffolk, Nassau, and Westchester counties. Um, but since we're focused on sustainable CT here, Connecticut, um, we're just going to focus on, on Deb and I. Um, and then we have more information for the Long Island Sound Study page. There are links to uh, uh, with on, within the Long Island Sound Study page that talk about the CCMP. Um, so again, if you're when you're applying for a futures fund or other things like that, um, you can find them in there. And then this is just a little bit more about our team, um, and then a little bit more about the hub itself, and the calendar and all that. Um, and yeah, overall, that's that's the main thing. And then if you if you walk into the website and you're not even sure where you want to start and you just have some keywords in mind, you can just click the search function. You can search grant writing assistance, workshop, funding, funding workshop. You can really just throw any keywords into that and it will bring you to what it assumes to be the, the closest thing to what you're looking for. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of an overarching understanding of the website. Um, and I am happy to pop the link in the chat and also to answer questions about that. But yeah, thank you. Sarah, that is such a beautiful site. I love it. I love every bit of that. That's so user-friendly and just really visually pleasing. Lots of great content too. So now we are at our time to ask questions of Kyle, Justin, and Sarah. If anyone has them or a small group, feel free to pop them in the chat or just come off mute and, and ask away. I've got a whole list teed up if, if we're a quiet group. Uh, I have a question, if I could, yes. Sarah. You, you, your organization is called CTC Grant, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And and the, but the web thing is the Long Island Sound Resilience dot org. What is mm -hmm. what is the relationship between CTC Grant mm -hmm. and LIS? resilience.org is that you, another name of your will you tell me okay yeah so i work for connecticut sea grant and so that's where i am based out of and that it's it's a part of yukon and so we're at the avery point campus and there's a whole range of uh experts who work there um and we have uh, people who focus on resilience and that's the group that i'm a part of and then we have people who focus on aquaculture um uh and uh communications education outreach um but we we all work together within the sphere of looking at um, coastal and inland uh, issues um, around Connecticut. We have someone who focuses on nature-based solutions. Um, but overall, that's what Connecticut Sea Grant is. And then um, from Connecticut Sea Grant, the, the Connecticut and New York Sea Grant uh, groups partnered 
and they developed um, the Sustainable and Resilient Communities team. And so that's where, um, where my position came in and Debs and also the three counterparts that are in New York. And the five of us work together focusing on Long, Long Island Sound related um, concerns. And so we are based under that CCMP concept of the Sustainable and Resilient Communities theme. And so um, we're able to be under the Long Island Sound study, but we're based out of the Sea Grant programs. And so that's where it comes into play. But our focus is Long Island Sound, but we are from Sea Grant. Okay, so I have another uh, another question that I don't know exactly how to ask, but um, I I'm in I work with uh, I'm on the board of uh, Audubon, Connecticut, and we've been uh, interested in how to look at the community resilience side of sustainability and relate it to the bird side, the stuff that was presented today, certainly by the first group and largely by your group, seem to be things that we're already uh, conversant with. We don't know how to look at how the community-based efforts interact with bird-based efforts. And we're trying to get a way to, because the dialogue today is very friendly to what we do, but sometimes the dialogue is very different. Uh, and and I was wondering if you had anybody that I could talk to, not today, but sometime, about how we might frame a conversation about that. Yeah, I can I can take a look into the contacts that I have. I think there should be someone through Sea Grant who should be able to to give you a little bit more information. Um, and I'm happy to provide you my email, and I can also uh, reach out to you, and we can talk a little bit more about um, who would be the best resource for that. Right. Thank you very much. Other questions. Well, I have one for Kyle and Justin. Um, so if someone wants to reach out to you, you provided your email addresses. Uh, there's a month left to put together an application, which might be enough time. But what about thinking forward? So let's say someone's like, wow, this is great. I, don't, I can't do it this month. 2025 is going to be my year. Can they still reach out to you for with 2025 in mind? And when would that work? When How does that work? Uh, Justin, do you want to take that one? <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. So we can definitely uh, help you workshop proposals for 2025. Um, that can be, you know, before this proposal date, that's May 13th, it can be afterwards. Um, you know, we would recommend meeting as soon as possible. Um, but we can definitely gear you towards 2025. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that um, the futures fund uh, CCMP themes, as Kyle had mentioned earlier, and kind of the structure of how that fits into the grant is changing for 2025. And we don't have those updates yet, um, but working with the knowledge that we have now, we can definitely help prepare folks for the upcoming cycle. Well, thanks. Okay, so we've got a question from Patty. Does anyone have any recommendations or suggestions for any volunteering opportunities in the Fairfield County, Connecticut area? What do you want to volunteer for? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live? Oops. That is Bridgeport. Music. Bridgeport. Wow. You know, what well, we uh we uh Audubon does a bunch of shore shore restoration projects, uh starting uh, with some of oh well, we have some in Stratford. And we also have set, we're going to start working in Hammonasset. You want to plant plants in the in a marsh? I got an opportunity for you. <laughs> Sounds pretty fun, Ben. <laughs> um, I know that Save the Sound also does cleanups throughout the summer. Um, so that could be another organization to look into. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not positive on, on when those are going to be, um, but I know that they do host them. Um, and so that could be another group as well. Thanks. Um, other questions?
Okay, I'm going to ask one to you, Sarah, about the grant writing eligibility. You mentioned, I think you mentioned towns are eligible, nonprofits and others, perhaps? Yeah, um, towns, nonprofits, um, you can have NGOs, um, really, really anyone's able to, to apply. Um, it just has to be a project that's within that coastal boundary, um, mm -hmm. just because we, uh, we tend to cover um, my Deb and I tend to cover within that coastal boundary. That's our focus. Um, but yeah. And if there's any concerns about eligibility, um, people are always welcome to reach out and we can always have that, that conversation talk a little bit more about if the project falls within the boundary, if it falls within, um, even a little bit, you know, like how we can move forward and, and figure out if it's eligible. Mm -hmm. Did you say that the organization can pick the grant writer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's actually the, the main portion of it as well. Um, so that we do have a list of grant writers that you can choose from if you're not sure where to start. Um, we have that on the, the FAQ document, um, which I can I can look up after I finish talking and I can put it in the chat. Um, and I can also send it to you, Jess, for a distribution mm -hmm. as well. Um, but the, the program, you're able to pick your grant writer from that list or externally. Um, the main thing is if they're not on that list or if they haven't gone through that vendor process to, to work under UConn, um, the funds go directly to the, the consultant or the, the person who would be writing the grant. And so they just have to be added into the UConn system, which can take a couple weeks. And so if they're not currently there, it just takes a little bit longer to make sure that we can get them added. Um, so that's just something to consider as you're you're selecting a grant writer, just making sure you budget in enough time for them to be added into the UConn system. Um, but we, we do allow um, for whoever you select to be your grant writer, um, as long as we're able to, to verify them getting added to the system. I would like to end with an inspirational question, I hope. Uh, hopefully the response is inspirational to Sarah, Justin, or Kyle. Um, just thinking about the Long Island Sound Future Fund, any, if you were to describe one amazing project, like this, this is the project, it touches on all of the elements, it is the shining star, does anything come to mind? That's, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Very good question. One yeah. that comes up for me is, it's, oh, I was just going to say, Ben, so one that comes up for me, it's not, I mean, maybe not a specific project, because I'd have to, like, actually go back and find, like, the, the title and everything, but the types of projects that cross state boundaries that really look at, like, if we're thinking about the nutrient loading and the nitrogen pollution that's happening in Long Island Sound, it's not all happening in Connecticut, it's not all in Massachusetts, it's not all in Vermont or New Hampshire. So those projects that cross state boundaries, even if it's or just cross jurisdictional boundaries, those that work regionally and look at the entire system to enhance water quality at the sound. I mean, that's that's a big feat. And to convince folks who are not on the coast that what they're doing upstream matters downstream. Anytime a project like that comes in and we've seen several of them, anytime it comes in, it's super exciting to just see that type of collaboration and to see that it's, it's actually working, that that whole regional approach is ultimately improving the quality of the sound. Yeah, and I will add as well that um, it's important to look at the project and see where it can go in the future. Um, I think it was mentioned that they want you to start the project within six months of the funding being uh, awarded, but then it, it's typically completed within two years or so. Um, but the, the overall arching goal is that this is a project that's going to be sustainable um, and trying to figure out how whether it's it's implemented and then you're able to continue to maintain that project with like a living shoreline or something like that, or if it's going to be a tool that's going to carry on and you're going to be able to update it moving forward. Um, I think just making sure that it's not necessarily a one off is going to help to improve your your application and your project um, and showing how you're going to continue to maintain and keep that that project alive and and uh, as a good resource moving forward. Um, I'll just add as well that for uh, Futures Fund, the past grant slates are available on the Futures Fund website, um, free for public access, and uh, you can view what has been funded. Um, some projects might be related, closely related to what you might be doing, if that helps provide any inspiration for people. Thanks. Uh, other thoughts, final questions? 
All right, we are at time. I want to do a big thank you to our speakers, Sarah, Justin, and Kyle, and to all of you for joining us this morning. We will send out the slide deck. I will send out the link to the Resilience Hub, and feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or us at Sustainable CT if you have questions or want to discuss any of the things you learned today. But thanks, everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, all.